Omar Barak, you're in Brussels today, but your uh, Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, is in Washington today, heading to President Obama to talk with him and to try to reboot the relationship between Pakistan and the US. The main talk uh, that we've been hearing is about drones. Is that the issue that is really in the way between the good, friendly relationships between Islamabad and Washington? It's one of the issues. I wouldn't say it's the only issue. Uh, there are many things that they'll want to discuss. For example, what will happen in Afghanistan as the US and NATO troops withdraw next year, what role Pakistan can play in terms of talks with the Taliban, if any, and in facilitating the withdrawal. Also, this is about, as you said, resetting a relationship that was nearly dead over the last year and a half. Um, since the raid in Abtabad when Osama bin Laden was killed, Pakistani relations between Pakistan and the US have been at their lowest point in history. So these will be discussions not just on drones, which is a major issue for Pakistani politicians and for the Pakistani public, uh, the US withdrawal, but also economic assistance, what the US can do in terms of energy, and what the two countries can do in terms of getting back to a normal relationship. And what will do the trick? How will they get back on track? I don't think we're looking at anything dramatic happening anytime soon. We'll be looking at slow incremental progress as things happen. We're already seeing an improvement in relations in the neighborhood, which the US would like. So, for example, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has met with his Indian counterpart, Manmohan Singh, for just an icebreaker. Nothing huge has happened there. There have been talks with President Karzai and some release of Afghan Taliban prisoners to follow up with that. Uh, so I think we're looking at a very slow process that will have to have incremental changes. There has been the proposal coming out of Pakistan that the US would be asked as, an, as a mediator for the Kashmir conflict. India has rebutted that, but is that a serious uh, proposal coming out of Pakistan? I don't think so. I don't think uh, we will see much movement on Kashmir anytime soon. Even in terms of talks with India, it looks as if there hasn't been, the composite dialogue has not been revived. I don't think anything new will happen on the front between Pakistan and India until you have a new Indian government in place after the 2014 elections in India. 2013 was the year of the elections in Pakistan, yes. and it provided uh, for a, a whole new political setup in a sense, or a new uh, power relations within uh, Pakistan. What would you say were the main uh, decision makers for the voters? How, on, on which lines did they decide to vote Nawaz Sharif into power? Well, I think the first thing the voters did was exercise their anti-incumbency. Um, they voted out a government they felt that had not performed, that had not lived up to its own promises. And so we see uh, the Pakistan People's Party of President Asif Ali Zadari, former President Asif Ali Zadari, uh, suffer its worst defeat since um, 1997. Um, subsequent to that, the two big issues that came across were energy and the economy. And it seems as if one of the reasons why Mr. Nawaz Sharif has got a significant majority is because he is the one who presented as a pro-business candidate uh, a better plan or at least talked in that direction towards reviving the economy and restoring Pakistan's energy, which has been a huge crisis with, you know, um, electricity going out for up to 20 hours in certain yeah. places. At the same time, though, we do see different results in different parts of the country. You have Baloch nationalist parties who have formed a coalition in Balochistan, which reflects some of the resentments there. Uh, in the Khayu Pakhtunkhwa province, Imran Khan's party leads a coalition there, which reflects not just anti-incumbency and disappointment with the governments that came before, but also an attitude that people are war weary and would like to see some sort of peace restored to the region. You don't mention religion in, in your list of worries for the voters, although what we see from Pakistan on Western TV screens is always linked with Islam or political Islam or militants. Is that something that is detached from the political uh, power relationships in, in Pakistan? Or how do, you, how do we read this? Well, Pakistan, because it is an overwhelmingly Muslim country and 
you know, most voters will describe themselves as being Muslims with varying degrees and different kinds of approaches to Islam. But no, religion is not a factor in Pakistani politics. I mean, none of the issues that were discussed had to do with religion. People did not vote on the basis that they felt someone was a better Muslim or a worse Muslim or, and, and so on. Um, terrorism and militancy and religious extremism are certainly issues, but what we are seeing is that it's just one of the issues that people are dealing with in Pakistan. Other issues like energy, like the economy, like education, uh, these things matter as well. But how then do you explain the focus on, on religious politics in media and, and in the international discourse about Pakistan? Well, unfortunately, I think there's uh, an overemphasis on that and, some, and in many ways a misunderstanding of what, where this violence is coming from and what it means for Pakistan. There is certainly a drift more towards uh, hardline religious attitudes within Pakistani society. That's apparent and that's true within the politics as well. So when we see, for example, the repression that religious minorities face. It's not as if the secular political parties are standing up and resisting that. Uh, there is a capitulation on that front as well. Um, similarly, when it's come to rising sectarianism, uh, the anti-Shia violence that we are seeing, these are obviously issues of concern, not just to Pakistanis, but to the world at large. Uh, you know, uh, extremism and destabilization of this kind matters to people all over the world. Uh, but again, we don't see the politicians come up with a response to this uh, in, in any serious way. And then this becomes a big worry uh, across the world. At the same time, unfortunately, there are a lot of conspiracy theories that circulate within Pakistan. And even the, re the reasons behind the rise of militancy within Pakistan are poorly understood. There are some people who will simply say that this is just America's war and once America goes it will end. That's not true. Yeah. So <clears throat> given that, how would you briefly state uh, what, what you see as the future for Pakistan, the, the subject of the Mole Lecture that you will be giving tonight? Um, how would you summarize your vision of the future? Well, I think Pakistan is going through some important changes. We are seeing the first thing I would say is that it's often said that Pakistan is on the verge of collapse or will collapse. That is not going to happen. I mean, that much uh, I can say with certainty. Otherwise, predicting Pakistan is often a hazardous thing to do. But I think we're seeing some changes. We're seeing a rising middle class that is growing in size and asserting itself in influence. I think we are seeing a state that is confronted by multiple problems, not just militancy as we have discussed, but also issues like energy, the economy, education for example. And these are issues that have, a, uh, have arisen not overnight, but as a result of decades of neglect, and they will continue to be issues uh, there. What we will see is a real test over these next five years in terms of what this new government and the provincial governments can do. If they can deliver some sort of real change for the voters, then we will probably see Pakistan become a stable democracy at least politically speaking, and then maybe it can go on a course towards reform. But I don't see anything dramatically changing in these ways anytime soon. Uh, the path, Pakistan need, desperately needs reform, but that will be slow incremental reform. So, optimist or pessimist? Optimist and pessimist. Which is the true journalistic answer to all questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Omar.